Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone ready to start? Okay. So um, I'm very excited because we have L&D royalty with Julie. Yes. I'm going to characterise her as that. Um, I see a weight in the learning, learning and development industry, and uh, I would suggest you get pens, paper, notepad, iPad, whatever you want to sort of take down notes because it's going to be very content rich. Um, uh, jet lag probably hasn't crept in yet, but she's flown all the way from Minneapolis to come and share with us. And uh, yeah, <laughs> um, and not only is Julie a learning strategist, but she also teaches as well. So um, really nice 360 in terms of what she'll bring. And it has real depth because it covers neuroscience, sustainable behavior change, I'll repeat, sustainable behavior change, and educational psychology. And lastly, if anyone wants to tweet from the session, the session identifier is hashtag T4S5. Uh, without further ado, over to Julie. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> how was lunch? Lunch was okay? It's good? All right, fantastic. Um, everything's just a little bit later here than it is at American conferences, so I'm always, I'm always like, oh, this is kind of nice. It's a little bit more leisurely. There's a little bit more time for lunch, things like that. Um, so uh, this session, Strategies for Complex Skill Development. Um, one of the things that I was finding as I was working in my own practice as an instructional designer is that when you le learn traditional instructional design, you get quite a good tool set for things that are knowledge-based or things that are very procedural. But when we start to kind of get beyond some of those categories, some of the tools really aren't as useful as I would like them to be. Um, and so what I wanted to do is look at, if we're dealing with really complex skills, what are some of the things or the strategies where you can um, uh, kind of understand the nature of the problem and then attach certain instructional strategies to that problem. So just to start out with what kinds of, you came to a session on complex skills, so I'm gonna guess that some of you have complex skills that you're creating training for. So what kind of stuff are we dealing with? Who's got one? Um, radio frequency theory. The theory. Radio frequency theory, nice. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Relationship management. Relationship management, yes. As soon as you get people involved, it gets messy and it does get complex. Firefighter skills. Firefighter skills, right, yeah. Because they're always dealing with a really complex, changeable environment and being able to adapt to that is a huge issue. E-commerce crime investigations, yes. Because that is an area where new things are happening every day in that space and it's constantly changeable. Yep, absolutely. Bomb disposal. Bomb disposal. Wow, you guys have some heavy topics. <laughs> this is kind of impressive, all right, okay. Yeah, it, absolutely. With really significant consequences. So, um, yeah, absolutely, okay. Anything else? Oh, one more back there. Dealing with conflicts with customers. Conflicts with customers, right? We say it like it's not that big a deal, but it is actually a very complex thing because every person's got a different, you know, kind of a different issue that they're dealing with. I think there was one more over here. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many complex issues there. Responding to disclosures of assault or violence. So how do you teach people to talk to, talk to people about that? Um, and I find that you take these kind of complex skills and we're at a learning technologies conference. When you move it into the world of things like e-learning, it gets an order of magnitude harder um, because, quite frankly, computers are stupid. Um, I love the thing this morning where uh, the, the keynote speaker was talking about how automation, by the definition of it, does the same thing over and over again, is essentially stupid. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of our computers are also stupid. And that's not necessarily, you know, they're, you know, the, like a, a criticism of using them, but we do need to appreciate what the limits are of those environments. Um, so uh, it's probably useful for me to define my terms. And I've got a few different ways that I think about complex skills, but I wanted to just start with how I define a skill. Um, and the, the question, the main question, there's a few others, but the main question I ask is when I'm deciding if something falls into this kind of skill category is, is it reasonable to think that somebody can be proficient without practice? And if the answer is no, then there's a good chance you're dealing with a skill. Might be procedural, but probably you're dealing with a skill. If you add in things like judgment 
or variable conditions, then you're definitely dealing with a skill, right? Um, and so uh, we're going to play a quick round of skill, not a skill, okay? Everybody's very excited, okay? Um, uh, so saving a file in Microsoft Word, skill or not a skill? <laughs> Sorry. How many people say skill? How many people say not a skill? There we go, show of hands, much better, okay. All right, not a skill, I would agree, I would think it's very procedural. Um, one of my other litmus tests for it is, can I call it up and tell my mother how to do it over the phone, and there's a decent chance she'll be successful. Notice I say decent chance, not, not likelihood. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a very procedural task. Okay, um, skee-ball, I have learned from experience, is not a reference that translates well in, in, uh, internationally. So we're gonna say volleyball, playing volleyball, skill or not a skill? Skill? Okay, anybody wanna argue with that one? Nope, great, okay. Um, giving performance reviews, skill? Anybody wanna say no? Nope, okay. That one's kind of interesting, right? Because we're saying that people can be better or worse at giving performance reviews, but I'll tell you from my personal experience, a lot of the performance review training I've seen has been very procedural. First do this, then do this, then do this. And there isn't much attention paid to the fact that what gets put in those boxes can be a very variable quality and that people can get better at it. And most of the training I see doesn't take that into account. Filling out a timesheet, skill? Nope, okay, nobody said skill, so, or almost nobody said skill. We're gonna go with not a skill. Calming an irate customer, skill? Yes, anybody? Nope, nobody's arguing with that one, okay. Building a database, skill? Yeah, probably, might, might be procedural, but um, designing a brochure, skill? Yes, okay. Um, making macaroni and cheese from the box. Again, I don't know if this is too American a reference, but what do you think, skill? Yeah, no, a couple of people. I will tell you that of all of these, I get the most debate on this one. <laughs> I get really passionate arguments on both sides. Um, okay, problem solving a missing supply order. Skill? Yeah, okay. You know, sort of mixed. How about programming the shopping cart widget for a website? Skill? Yep, okay, all right. So you get a pretty good sense of kind of where these definitions are. Um, and what's the implied piece of this? If this is the question that we're using to judge if something's a skill, it is not reasonable to think that somebody can be proficient without practice. What is the obvious conclusion of that in when we start to think about our learning design? Needs to include practice, right? And practice design is an interesting area to me because if you look at how um, video game programmers learn to do their jobs, they know a lot about how much practice somebody is gonna need to acquire a particular skill before they can level up to certain things. And they think, of, they map it. I've seen, I've seen actual skill curves mapping, you know, where does somebody need to be in terms of speed or proficiency before we can move them up and things like that. But that's not usually, I mean, if anybody's seen training on this particular area for instructional designers, I'd love to see it because I'm, trying to you know, kind of gather up as much of this as I can. But I find that it's, you know, how do you structure and design practice is not necessarily something that I see being treated a lot when we're having conversations about instructional design, but yet it's one of the core characteristics of you know, getting better at the thing that we're talking about. And I'm not saying nobody puts practice in, but how do you think about it? And I sometimes call this the sports and things where you can kill people conundrum which is we realize this innately when it's a visible skill or when you can kill people. So you would never expect that you could call somebody up and explain golf on the phone and then that person would be able to go play golf proficiently. You just know inherently that that's not a true statement. You also don't want the doctor who hasn't practiced some, right? I don't know about here, but in the US, they all start um, their internships on July 1. So if you can avoid the emergency room that day, it's probably a good choice. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then you also don't want the helicopter pilot who just passed the written test and that's all they've done. Um, or driving. How long, is, um, how long is the practice interval for driving? Like how, much, how many hours of practice do you need to get your license where you live or in the UK? What's that? Varies, what range, approximately? 
30 hours? Yeah, 30, I think in the US it's maybe 30 to 60 depending on where you live and things like that. The expectation that you're gonna have 30 to 60 hours before they turn you loose on unsuspecting um, uh, motorists and pedestrians. How many hours do you think when somebody's a new manager that they get before we turn them loose on their teams? Anybody want to argue for 30 to 60 hours? Could be. Certain organizations take it very seriously. But in all likelihood, maybe they're not getting that much practice before they get you know, to start experimenting on their team. Um, what do you think is, I, I'm, I'm curious, which one do you think is ultimately more complex? Driving or being a good manager? How many people go with driving? OK. Is a strong, good manager? Strong, leaning towards it, right? So why do we know that you need to have a lot of practice for driving, but for being a good manager, even though it's arguably a more complex task, we're willing to you know, put people through two days of leadership training and send them out into the world, right? Um, and again, you know, hopefully if you're a bad manager, you're not killing people, although that's not 100%, right? People work in hazardous environments or people deal with, um, you know, driving and all of these kinds of things where poor management can actually lead to um, hazardous, hazardous things. Um, also, one of the other variables you want to think about when you're thinking about how complex a skill is, is how complex or context dependent is the application of that skill. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, there's a metaphor that Chris Deedy uses, and he's an educational technology person at Harvard, and he uses this when he's talking about how there's a tendency amongst educational technology people to fall in love with a solution and then want to apply it to everything. Never happens in our field, I'm sure. Um, but he talks about how different problems have different natures depending on the complexity or the variability of, con of um, context. And so he talks about how there could be like sleeping problems. <laughs> and wherever you are in the world, a sleeping problem is likely to have the same you know, solution characteristics. It should be warm, dark, safe, quiet, private probably. You know, those are your main things. And as long as you've got those characteristics, it's gonna be a decent answer to a sleeping problem. However, you also have eating problems. And what's the answer to an eating problem? Well, it depends, right? Is it breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Is it family? Are you just trying to get nutrition? Is it between, you know, during your work day? Is it a social occasion? Is it a work event? Is it a celebration? Is it a holiday? You know, the answer to an eating problem varies really pretty widely, um, depending on what uh, depending on what the initial problem is. And then you have bonding problems where how do you bond with something? What's the answer to a bonding problem? Well, that's going to really vary widely depending on whether you're bonding with you know, a child or a family member or a coworker or a stranger in the elevator or somebody, you know, a romantic partner or your boss or any number of things or clients. And what's appropriate in one environment is wildly inappropriate in another environment, and it still happens, and that's why you do harassment training. But, um, but you know, the answer is gonna be really variable, and it's really gonna depend on circumstances. And so one of the questions you wanna ask yourself is in this skill is how variable is the context in which we're gonna to have to apply it? So in some cases, not, not as much, and in other cases, a lot. And that's gonna impact how you think about the solutions. Um, so when we think about complex skills, some examples might be a substance abuse therapist. Um, uh, somebody brought up the, the thing about uh, people reporting um, you know, violence or you know, abuse or things like that. They, there's a really high degree of sensitivity and responsiveness to what the person's telling you. you know, that might be similar to what you know, a substance abuse therapist might have to deal with, that kind of thing. Project management budgeting, I mean, the procedure is pretty straightforward, but then it gets into all sorts of complexity when we get into like avoiding problems or making sure that you're in scope or things like that. Um, Six Sigma statistical process control just has lots of parts, right? So as we look at these, one of the models that was really helpful to me in terms of thinking about this is the Kenevan model. And if there are Welsh people in the room, you can tell me if I'm even close to pronouncing that right. I make no guarantees. Um, uh, 
But this is David Snowden's model, and he uses it to talk about organizational challenges, but I find it's a useful framework to kind of apply towards complex skills issues. And he talks about um, simple, the more recent model of the version of the model, he, he's changed that uh, quadrant to obvious. I've, I've left simple, but either one is fine. Um, complicated, complex, or chaotic. And I'll talk about each one of these. Um, and in the center, there's disorder, which I'm not gonna deal with today, but um, so obvious, simple or obvious problems don't mean that they're simple from a number of steps point of view, but they're, they're obvious because we know what the solution looks like. So anything where we have done the heavy lifting to define correct performance is a simple problem. So it's well-defined problems, and there's a clear relationship between cause and effect. So a lot of places where you'll see things that are quite <laughs> you know, complicated in terms of how many steps they are, but we've defined all of the steps for performance, or healthcare, or um, safety, or often things where that comes up. It might be procedural stuff, it might be compliance-based, anything where it's a straightforward task. We know what correct performance looks like, we can say that was correct or incorrect, you know, unquestionably, when people are actually performing. Um, and so it could be updating a medical record, very procedural, right? There could be a couple of different ways to do a thing, but we still know if somebody's correct or incorrect in terms of performance. Could be running a hotel breakfast service. It could be daily plant operations at a power plant, which may have thousands and thousands of pieces to it, but it's still simple by our definition, which is we know exactly what correct performance is. We know it, you know, we'll know when we see it. Um, complicated, on the other hand, is things where experts are beneficial. So it's, there's, there's probably a solution, but you kind of need an expert to help you tell you what it is. Um, it often requires expertise or analysis. It's gained through repeated exposure and practice. Um, I was having lunch with the 30 under 30 people yesterday, and I'm starting to, they were, we were talking about how things had changed in the industry, and I started to say, well, I've been in this industry, and then I realized, longer than most of you have been alive. <laughs> so. It's like, oh, okay. Um, but, um, uh, but because of that, if somebody comes and brings in, you know, a fairly reasonable training question, I immediately kind of am like, oh, well, tell me this. Okay, tick, tick, tick. And I've got kind of a little decision tree internally in my head where I'm going, okay, I think we can discard that set of solutions. Let's look over here, ask some more questions. Okay, here I've narrowed it down to a few things that we probably want to start exploring, right? And if I did the heavy lifting, I could draw out more or less a decision tree. Um, Kathy Moore has done a really nice one for his training a problem where she actually does it as a decision tree flowchart, um, you know, things like that. So we could take that expertise and if I could figure it out, because sometimes it's invisible to us, but if I could figure it out, I could draw it out and, you know, it wouldn't be a perfect answer, but you can sort of see the logic behind it. Um, and cause and effect can be recognized through that expert experience. An expert can look at this and go, here's the problem here in three places. They've got a very clear view of the world, right? So things where judgment's required. There's maybe some variability of con uh, context, but it's where expertise experience is crucial. So it might be playing chess, where people recognize patterns. So as soon as the move's played, they've got a whole series of patterns in their head to know what to do with that. Um, it could be medical research where it's not exactly procedural, but people have, as they get more experience, they know where, you know, exactly how they're going to kind of flow through your thing. Could be business consulting in some cases. Not everyone, we'll talk about that in a moment, but, um, but you know, these are things that are complicated, and as you get more and more experience and more case examples, you kind of gain this expertise. Now, the issue is you can move from complicated to simple if you're willing to do the work but often it's just playing too costly. It's too expensive to kind of decode all that. It's cheaper to just build more experts in those cases. But airline safety is a case where the cost of not having that expertise is, again, you can kill people. And so they've said it's worth the money that it takes to take the knowledge of a pilot and turn it into checklists or procedures or things like that. And it's really quite a remarkable thing, airline safety. I saw a statistic somewhere that um, when they decide that they need to make a change to the procedures, that change is disseminated through the entire kind of air, air transit safety system within about 30 days, which if you think of how long it takes to like, communicate stuff in your organization is amazing, right? 
Um, and so that's a case where their deliberate decision to move something from complicated into simple exists because they're trying to squeeze error out of the system because error is very, 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 very bad, right? Um, complex problems, though, are kind of cases where there really isn't a right answer because it depends on all sorts of things, right? So anytime somebody asks you a question, you're like, oh, I know you think it's a simple question, but the, it really just depends. There's likely to be some complex in there. An expert can't show up and just tell you the answer, but what they can do is they can tell you methods of inquiry. So there's no right answers necessarily, and patterns emerge over time, and eventually it may get moved into the complicated domain because now we have enough experience with it that we're starting to feel confident about it. Um, and cause and effect can usually only be deduced in retrospect. So this might be, and it's, it's often scenarios where there's change around stable circumstances. So this might be like innovation, is almost certainly a complex problem where nobody can walk up and say, here's the new product that you should build and everybody's gonna love it, right? Um, I was watching a documentary on the flight over about a company called General Magic, which you never heard of, but they built smartphones way before smartphones and then nobody bought them because they were crazy expensive. Um, but they had, they had done all of this stuff, you know, at least a decade before um, you know, the, the actual devices came out and we adopted them. Um, unforeseen events, you know, can fall into complex. And then also anything where we're responding to volatility. So if you call, so design innovation, um, product pricing. If you talk to a product pricing expert, and I have done this actually about some stuff, they will not tell you here's the price you should charge for your product. They will tell you here's how you do research with your audience. Here's how you do comparison against the marketplace. Here's how you test out your pricing to make sure that it's gonna be effective. They can't tell you the answer because there's no answer. And the right price to charge for something could change tomorrow because a new competitor comes into the marketplace. Or Google makes it and throws you out of business because now it's free. Um, things like that. Uh, and Amazon pricing is a reflection of the fact that that pricing, in order to sell the most things, they're constantly tweaking and experimenting with the prices of things. Um, executive leadership, that's probably <laughs> another place where it's about responding to volatility. We have all these leadership training programs like we know the right answer to what being a good leader is and the truth is it's probably more about testing solutions and then making sure that they're good and um, then continuing on. So really the strategy here is probe sense respond. I'm gonna try something, I'm gonna learn how to, to run an experiment or to investigate it, I'm gonna learn how to understand the data I get back and then I'm gonna learn how to make a, a reasonable judgment based on that data. So it's not I'm gonna learn an right answer, I'm gonna learn a method of inquiry. So chaotic problems, our last category. Um, cause and effect are unclear. Triage and act to establish order is usually all you can do. You are probably going to have to act before you have all of the information. So you do the best you can in those circumstances. Um, try to pull things back to a more stable situation. So on the ground after the earthquake hits, might be a disaster scenario. Um, the collapse of something, a business or whatever. Um, it could be disaster response, it could be responding to a cyber attack that you've never seen before. You know, it could be a financial crisis. We're going to have to continue to move forward and try to deal with this before we can possibly have all of the information because we can't just sit here and let it happen to us. But it's gonna be, you know, the answer is gonna be constantly changing as the situation emerges. And so when we get into that, we're really dealing with you know, everything's a bit of a mess, but how can we start to bring order back into the environment? Um, which is act, sense, respond. You're gonna have to act before you can um, uh, necessarily respond. So if we look at these, the impact on learning starts to get really interesting because what you need is a learning experience depending on what type of problem you're dealing with starts to change quite a bit. Um, simple is easy, you know, and if we think about um, particularly well suited to e-learning it turns out because you can say something's right or wrong and that's what computers are better at than anything where it's kind of ambiguous, right? Um, so simple tasks, it's well suited to maybe e-learning self-study, it could be tested with recognition-based tasks. And if you take nothing else out of this, stop um, letting people try to tell you that you can write multiple choice questions unless it's a simple domain. In any of the other domains, Multiple choice questions are not your friend for the most part. 
It can be done, but it's real hard. Um, so simple is where that kind of testing, right, wrong answers is, is the most productive. It can be evaluated by a computer, so it could be software training, or it could be you know, multiple branching scenarios. These are all things that are well suited to simple where we know what correct performance looks like. We can say unequivocally, this is a right answer, this is a wrong answer. So complicated. So this is something where expertise is gained through reported, repeated exposure to case examples. So what do you think that the implication of that is for our learning design? Nobody wants to talk. <laughs> I've got one in the back. Um, you've got to break it down into steps and you keep repeating those steps that they get wrong. And yeah. Not make them feel that when they're getting it wrong, it's the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that is un unquestionably one of the big strategies with complicated is to start to break it down into smaller pieces that people can do. But the other piece of this is also that if repeated exposure to case examples are what uh, cause people to start to understand the patterns across multiple instances of a complicated skill, then you start to have to think about how is my learner going to get repeated exposure to case examples. So if you're using one case study to teach something that's complicated, that's probably not enough. We'll talk in a minute about what is enough, and the answer is eh, when, when there is enough, um, unfortunately. Uh, but complicated tasks, it's usually requiring multiple cases or scenarios, because you have to start connecting the pattern across instances to start to be able to tell. So we had our firefighter example. You would never assume that you could just train a firefighter with one example of a house fire because you're just not going to get enough of, the, enough of the patterns across things. You need to be able to expose people to a lot of different situations and a lot of different scenarios before they can start to kind of really understand the principles that they're dealing with. Um, it can be tested with performance-based tasks. So again, you, should, you could do really good scenario questions if you're good at writing those, but by and large, you really should have somebody performing and having an expert evaluation on that because trying to get a computer to evaluate these is like trying to get your Dalmatian to give you feedback on your you know, yoga poses. It's just not, it's not, it's not gonna work real well. I, I totally don't think that analogy holds, sorry, but you know. <laughs> Shouldn't make things up on the fly, apparently. Um, other possibilities include self-assessment or peer assessment, and I'll show, you, I'll show you some examples of how we've done that. Um, rehearsal, I don't think they're here at the expo, but that's one where you, uh, they do like customer service or sales training and people record themselves and then they can submit that recording to an expert who will give them feedback on it. So it is an electronically mediated way to do that feedback, but it still involves having an expert be able to kind of go, this is good, this is not so good, right? Um, oh, here's an example of how if you really, really, really have to put this into some kind of self-study learning, this is a strategy that we use. This is... Um, from a prototype, and you can tell there's typos in it, that's how you know it's a prototype, right? Um, a prototype that was done, so it's very rough, for a anti-bullying training uh, curriculum for teachers. And so they had had all sorts of material about, here's about bullying, here's how you should respond, but then they, we wanted something where the teachers actually kind of constructed a response instead of just recognizing one. Because a lot of e-learning is recognition. Can I tell the best response from a series of three Sure, but that's not what you're doing in the real world. You're actually putting together a constructing response. And unfortunately, our keynote speaker this morning notwithstanding, we mostly don't have AI that can you know, evaluate a typed response and tell you if it's good or bad or not yet. Um, I was doing, I was presenting on this at Google and I'm like, well, maybe you guys do. <laughs> you possibly might have that, that capability. Um, but if we have you know, a child's talking to them, if they type their answer, then they can evaluate their answer against some criteria. So it's self-assessment. Because in a, any kind of self-study e-learning program, the most intelligent operator in that system is actually the learner. They don't know the subject matter, but they're still smarter than your computer, right? And so they can look at it and go, did I do all of those things? Now, granted, they have to make the effort, and if they choose not to, then you know, they don't. But um, I'm also in favor of occasionally trusting our learners. Uh, and then after that, they could decide, okay, I want to revise it and make it better. And after they've revised it, they can then compare it to what three different teachers might have said to that child. And part of what we're acknowledging there by not just having a single answer to compare it to is that this is not an exact science, how you talk to a kid about this. 
There's going to be some elements that should be common, but different teachers might talk to different children in different ways, and that that's OK. So if nothing else, we're at least, it's all self-assessment. They're comparing themselves to different, um, different people. But at least we're acknowledging this isn't something where there's a single right answer, and that's the only possibility out there in the world. Um, complex, so that's our methods of inquiry, changing conditions, all those sorts of things. So it's complex tasks. It's learning a method of inquiry. It re really requires real world practice in most cases. You might be able to argue me that it doesn't, but I, 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 I'm going to hold to that belief at least for the time being. Um, it could be an online workshop format if you need to do a technology mediated version. Otherwise, you could obviously do this in live classroom and things like that. So you might have a thing where people are going out, you know, you do it over a course of weeks. If it's a user experience design, which I would think is a complex thing, you might have them go out and interview users and bring their results back. And then you might have them create a prototype and go out and test it and bring their results back. And that they're sort of seeing, oh, here's the complexity of this in the real world and I'm getting different answers from different users and things like that. So you think about how do they actually try out the method of inquiry, get some feedback, and start to develop some proficiency at doing that activity. There's some design thinking sessions here today. Um, Miriam and Connie did one. And design thinking is very much that sort of method of inquiry kind of thing that you can use to go out, gather information, come back, and make decisions based on it. Um, then our last one, um, chaotic. Honestly, I, I used to think that we didn't really have that much to add into this, but obviously we train you know, first responder people and people who deal with emergency situations. And so a lot of what our responsibilities are here is giving people enough practice in real environments that they've got emotional self-regulation when they're actually getting into those scenarios. So our, you know, somebody's reporting abuse or somebody's dealing with firefighting training or bomb disposal, holy cow, <laughs> um, bomb disposal, you know, those kinds of things. Part of what's necessary in that situation is this person has to operate in an incredibly tense and stressful situation and still be able to function. And what we seem to know from the relationship between stress and learning is you have to build up to that level. You can't just throw people into it, right? Um, Sarita Robinson, that's a picture of, she's a researcher, I think, I think the University of Eastern Lancashire, um, but she's done a lot of study into stress um, and learning and she, she's sitting by a pool because she's used, uh, a lot of her research is HEAC training, which is the helicopter thing where they put you in the simulated he helicopter under, uh, like upside down in the underwater and you have to be able to get out. Um, but you can't start there, right? <laughs> you can't start with things. Um, and so it's, uh, it's enough practice that you can manage the stress. Um, one of the things she was talking about, I was listening to an interview with her and she was talking about the fact that in a panic situation, people um, revert back to the most known thing. So in the helicopters, you release the seatbelt by in the middle here but everybody's fumbling down here because that's where their car seatbelts were. You know? And so getting retraining some of those automatic responses is part of this. Um, and then also just procedures to triage and bring things back into order so that you can kind of move it to one of the other domains and deal with it differently at that point. So any questions about these domains before I go on? Stunned you all into immobility, great. Um, okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's a tough problem because obviously there's still going to be a jump. I mean, people who are participating in a simulation know that it's a simulation. However, it's interesting because I think sometimes your bodies don't always know. You know, you know, like you're in a scary movie, your body is reacting like it's scary even though your brain, you know, the sort of more logical, rational parts of your brain know that it's filmed on this film set and it's not really happening and, you know, things like that. And so you can induce a lot of the physiological reactions, um, you know, in these simulations that are still going to help you develop those kind of responses so that you can handle it when you're in uh, things. But a lot of it is, you know, feeding it out in small pieces so that you're working up to it because if you put somebody into too stressful a learning situation, 
they become very focused on getting out of the situation, but it doesn't necessarily promote memory. It can actually block the formation of new memory. And so if you're throwing other information at them while they're in this stressful situation, they're gonna remember the part about getting out, but they're not gonna remember anything else you tell them pretty much. Um, uh, so, you know, it's about being careful. Stress is kind of, uh, Clark Quinn talks about it being a, kind of a U-shaped curve. A little bit is good, too much is um, a lot. And then it's, um, you know, we have this concept called flashbulb memory, which is sort of the where were you when this bad thing happened and people can remember exactly where they're standing and, you know, do all of those kinds of things. And that's a different function, um, which is, you know, I'm having this intense emotional reaction. It's, a, we were evolved to, you know, intense emotional reactions are often things associated with survival. And so, you know, your, your system's set up getting out of it, but it's just gonna capture all the details in case you need it sometime in the future is sort of the theory behind that. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna remember everything because, you know, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big catastrophic. But I don't actually remend, recommend that as a learning strategy because it's a lot of stress to get there. Um, I, think, I think the gradually stepping people into it is a much better way to a much better way to go about it, so. Um, uh, okay, so a couple of other variables that show up when we're thinking about um, designing for complex skills that point to certain types of interventions in our design. Um, so time to acquire, whether it's tasked or explicit, how much variability there is, um, error tolerance, and speed of, speed of performance, essentially. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these. Um, so time to acquire, how long does it take to get good at it? Um, anybody, uh, the GMAT, I don't, I, think, I don't know if it's just American or if you have it here, but this is the test that people take in the U.S. to go to business school. So it's, you know, if they want to apply to a business school. And I, one of my early teaching jobs was teaching GMAT classes, and it wasn't great. There was a sort of air, you know, air of desperation in the room that you know, was sort of unsettling. But, um, uh, but we would do it over a weekend. And so Friday night, they'd come in, they'd take a practice test. Saturday, we'd have class. Sunday morning, we'd have class. Sunday afternoon, they take another practice test. And we could usually bump up their scores on math and the logic reasoning sections by you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 points. We usually couldn't budge their um, reading, the verbal scores, so reading comprehension and things like that. Any theories why we could bump math and logic but not reading? Anybody have any ideas on that one? Readings needs practice, right? How do you learn to read better? Well, you read a lot and then you read some more, and then you read some more. And that's usually how you get better at reading. And there's some strategies you can use and a few tricks we could teach people, but mostly it's through a lot of, a lot of repeated practice. Um, you mentioned in what was talked by Patty, um, reading is complex, mathematics is not. Right, right. Mathematics is complicated, you know, is, is either simple or complicated depending on what you're dealing with, but reading is, is you know, that more complex where it's, it's lots of variables are involved and you don't always understand everything about it, but that's okay. Um, and so, yeah, you've got a lot of things going on there. And so, typically, the simpler the things are, the faster the acquisition is. Um, one of my favorite things is uh, when a client tells me, you know what the real problem is? And this is after, while we're working on like a 20 minute safety course or something, 20 minute e-learning safety course. You know, the real problem is they just don't have good problem solving skills. Can we teach them good problem solving skills? And I'm like, in 20 minutes, sure, that'll fix it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we have to be realistic. We might be able to move somebody down the line a little bit around their problem solving, or we might be able to teach them a specific technique for problem solving. But that problem solving is very much one of those kind of complex skills that you learn methods of inquiry, and you also, it's probably a combination of both complicated and complex in that instance. And by the way, things are not always in just one domain. Different pieces of it can be in different domains if I didn't, if I didn't already say that. Um, and some things are just faster than others. So with, with people, knowledge, specific tools, techniques, concepts, principles, those are reasonably fast. Skills and attitudes are usually slower to change. And some of the foundational stuff, culture, core values, personality traits, you're better off not trying to actually change those because quite frankly, you're better off just trying to get the right person into that situation. That should be handled at hiring, not, at, um, not in training, when, those, when there's a strong mismatch there. So, um, so the diff there's a different rate of change for all of these kinds of things. And I found it very useful to talk to subject matter experts about just fast, medium, or slow. You can define those terms however you want. Maybe fast is a day, medium is a week, slow is a month, or maybe it's, Fast is a year, medium is you know, five years, 
slow is an entire career. You can define them however you want, but if you can attach some definitions to those and kind of talk through the learning objectives of the subject matter experts and have, you t have them tell you, is it fast, medium, or slow? And I, every time I've done it, they're like, oh yeah, that's fast. That's kind of medium. No, that's really slow. And it changes the conversation. It's been very helpful for me. It changes the conversation because if they're the ones telling you it's slow, now you have to have a strategy for slow. Because if it took them, you can also ask them how long did it take you to get good at it? Because if it took them five years to get good at it, you're not gonna change it in two days. But now you can sort of say, okay, well we might be able to get five years down to two years, but we need a plan for those 24 months, how we're gonna bring people along so that we're doing it as efficiently as possible. You know, something like that. If they want you to cut it by more than 50%, you know, be wary of that scenario, right? Um, uh, another factor is, is it tacit or explicit? And the question is, how, how do people learn something? So explicit things are things you can say out loud. This is a true statement, or this is a principle, or this is a best practice, whatever it is. Tacit are things you learn through that pattern recognition piece, right? And a lot of complicated sits in here. Um, so, Understanding cultural differences when you go to a different culture, do you think that that's learned more tacit or more explicit? How many people would say more tacit? Sort of unspoken. Okay, more explicit? A few people. Yeah, and there's some explicit things that you can learn. There always are. You know, don't, don't, you know, I don't know, insult the host's food or whatever it is. Although, it seems like you should know not to do that. I don't know. Um, uh, but, Preventing accidents in the workplace, is that more tacit, unspoken, or more explicit? How many people would say tacit? Okay, explicit. Yep, yeah, probably. Um, as would be standard operating procedures for immunization. How about getting to the actual root cause of a problem? So you're analyzing a problem, you're teaching people how to analyze problems, you're teaching them maybe root cause analysis, they're using uh, analysis methods. How, you know, do you, does that one feel like it's more explicit or more tacit? How many people would go tacit? Okay, quite a few. Explicit? Yeah, okay. Um, I was working with a group of experts who do improvement science in healthcare. And so they were trying to create a training course to teach um, healthcare practitioners how to basically do experiments in their, in their own hospital or clinic or whatever it is. So you wanna change something about how you're providing care, set it up as an experiment, get data back, things like that. And so they said, well, we do root cause analysis and we use this model and this model and this model. And I'm like, great, how do they know when to stop? And each, I had a room full of experts and they all looked at me and they're like, oh, you, you just know. I'm like, great, because that's not hard to explain to new people at all, right? You just know, okay. So anytime you hear that, you know it when you see it, you just know, when you get familiar with it over time, any of those kinds of things are big flashing keywords that tell you you're dealing with something that's primarily learned tacitly through repeated exposure to patterns. So I wanna talk about that briefly. Um, anybody know about chick sexing? And it's very important to pronounce that right um, <laughs> when I talk about it. <laughs> I've got one person here, okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just explain it actually so we can keep going. But um, when chicks, baby chicks are born, it's really important to know if they're male or female, especially if your main business is egg production because the males aren't gonna help you that much with it. We don't wanna think about what happens to them. But, um, just put that over there. Um, but uh, for a long time, it turn, but it turns out it's not very easy to tell on a baby chick. It's just, it's not obvious, right? You know, baby human, you're pretty clear most of the time. Not always, but, um, but a baby chick, it's really not, there, there's no really good visible cue that tells you. Um, and it, for a long time, the best chick sexers, it's a real job, I swear to God, um, were, um, were trained in Japan. And the way that they would learn to do this is an expert would go through, and I don't know where the expert came from, it's a very chicken and egg scenario, but I understand. Um, but an expert would go through and go male, male, female, male, female, 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 male, right? They'd do them. And then the, the novice would come in, not having heard all that, would come through, guess, find out if they're right, guess, find out if they're right, guess, find out if they're right. And if you do this many, many, many thousands of times, you get pretty good at it, but you can't say what you're looking at, which I find fascinating and really weird. But, um, uh, but that's a case, of like sort of a really extreme example of learning through tacit, tacit exposure and recognition. 
Um, there's, this is actually, the, sorry, the picture's from a different study, um, but there are some studies that have done with people on, with autism, autism spectrum, um, uh, who are on the autism spectrum who can't recognize facial expressions very well. And how did you learn whether a facial expression meant mom was really mad or not so mad or you know, whatever it is? How did you learn those things? You just did, right? It's a very clear example of tacit learning <laughs> in most people. And for whatever reason, and I don't, I, I don't claim any expertise in autism um, spectrum, but, uh, but for whatever reason, there are people who didn't learn this. And so they try to learn it through actual, like, basically flashcards, right? What about this expression? What do you think? Uh, angry. Okay, no, you know, that kind of thing. And they'll go through it. And they're dealing, obviously, with very subtle differences in these expressions. And, you know, you get into issues of where's the line and all of these kinds of things. But, um, but, but as a way of kind of learning to recognize it again through enough pattern recognition that you start to understand what the similarities are, which is something we, most people kind of learned as a child without having to think about it. People have to learn it in a much more explicit fashion. Um, the person who's done the most work on this is probably Anders Ericsson. Uh, he's a researcher. This is, how many people know this book? A couple people? Okay, yeah, it's very good and I highly recommend it. He talks about deliberate practice for proficiency. Um, I think Patty, somebody asked Patty, earlier about the 10,000 hour rule, which is not really a thing. <laughs> um, it's not really 10,000 hours, it's until you're done, um, whatever that number is. Um, and it varies depending on the complexity of the task. But Anders Ericsson has done a lot of the research and that's where it came from in Malcolm Gladwell's book um, uh, and so forth, Outli Outliers? Yeah, I think, or Blink. Outliers? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and so what um, Erickson did is he looked a lot at music training, he looked a lot at training radiologists, he looked at um, some other areas. Uh, and usually domains, again, where we kind of know what good performance looks like. The nice thing about both music and sports is that they're very mature domains in the way that they do the training because they've had visible results. Either that's a sour note or the ball doesn't go in or you know, things like that. So, um, Skills training in those areas is, is much more mature and there's still debate about how you do it, but they have a much better sense of it because they, they've done you know, decades and to hundreds of years of trial and error practice on it. So Anders Ericsson, one of the projects that he worked on was training radiologists to read x-rays and they created a database of I think 16,000 um, x-rays where they knew the outcome of it and so then radiologists to get trained would look at the x-ray, decide if they thought there was a problem or not a problem in that x-ray, and then find out the outcome and then go on to the next one. So it's like, it's like the chick's x is picking up the, the baby chickens. Um, but it was a way to get them exposure to much, much more case examples than they would just get in you know, classrooms where they might see 20. You know, instead, they could go through 200 in fairly short succession to increasingly train it. Now, it so happens that the things that are best served by learning that way are also some of the things that may ultimately be best served by AI because this is generally speaking how AIs um, will learn a lot of things is that repeated exposure, find out if they're right or wrong. Uh, okay, um, another factor to kind of consider. Um, so tacit or explicit, the big issue there for learning really comes down to, again, how many case examples are people going to need to see in order to start to do the pattern recognition. And I would love to tell you a, like a really nifty heuristic for figuring that out and the answer is, Again, as many as it takes, somewhere between one and 16,000, I'm confident, okay? But um, beyond that, it's gonna be more of a matter of experimentation with your learners to determine that. Um, variability, there's a couple of ways that think about variability. Um, one of them is how big is the gap between okay and great? So how big is the gap between your, a new but competent weight person? So I'm not talking about your bad people that you need to you know, get the people who are meeting the standard who are acceptable and the person who's really great. And if you think about it, you can ask the question, are they, is the person who's really great twice as efficient and effective as my least person? Are they five times? Are they 10 times as effective? Um, and what that tells you is if you have a big gap between your okay and your great, you probably should be looking at additional um, training somewhere in there to continue to move people up that scale. Some people will move up the scale just through experience and that's probably fine, but what they've actually found, they did some studies in medical education and found that kind of people plateaued at about the five year mark. And so the people who were okay doctors kind of stayed okay after a certain point 
And the people who were great doctors were people who were, you know, the good self-directed learners who continued to improve their practice. Um, but if you want somebody to move beyond that plateau, there probably needs to be some additional intervention, whether it's coaching. Um, it could be coaching is a, probably an effective strategy in that instance. Here's how you get better at things that you do. Um, but if you've got a big gap there, that tells you that there's quite a, probably quite a lot of opportunity in that space. Um, so for example, the gap between your best and your least assembly worker, uh, don't quote me on these, but conceptually I think they're about right, um, maybe was two to one, like the, you know, one person was twice as efficient at it as the other, but the gap in computer programming might be more like 10 to one. Your best programmer might be 10 times as fast and as efficient and bug free as your least person just because they've learned all sorts of strategies for doing that. Um, another part of variability is how many correct, perform correct answers can there be? So if two people take exactly the same blood pressure, do we sort of, and I know that's not technically possible, but just conceptually, if we, if we ask that question, would you expect them to be pretty close? Yeah, I mean, maybe not exactly identical, but they should probably be pretty close, right? If you gave an assignment to two, graph, you know, two web designers to build a website for a particular client and they both came back to you with something good, would you expect them to look pretty much exactly alike? No, right? Okay, so in certain tasks, especially simple things, there's a very narrow range of what we think is acceptable um, standards around what can be a good answer. In other areas, like designing a website or something like that, we have a much wider range of what could be considered an acceptable answer. And that's gonna tell you two things about any kind of learning intervention that you're doing. One is, we're back to our case examples, right? If there can be lots of right answers, I probably need to see more than one example in the learning experience. I probably need to see multiple examples. And another one is that critique is probably a useful, a useful strategy when there's multiple kind of examples so that you can kind of start to pick apart what's good, what's not good, you know, those kinds of things. Um, Another question is error tolerance, and this goes to can you kill people, you know? Um, which one has probably greater error tolerance? Error is more acceptable. Flight attendant drink service safety training or flight attendant drink service training? Which one is error more acceptable? I'm hoping it's drink service training. <laughs> I'm hoping that's the answer, right? Um, so one, uh, what do you think the implication for learning design is if, is if you have a very low tolerance for error in the environment because again, usually due to safety or something like that or business criticality, what's the, what's the implication from a learning design point of view? What probably needs to be happening as part of your learning experience if you have very low error tolerance? More practice, yeah, and it's not sexy. I'm sorry, it's not, but it's just, it's that increased level of practice. Yeah, certification, absolutely. Some kind, of, some kind of validation that they have actually reached the standard that we need. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, and like I said, not sexy, but, but clearly, clearly part of the equation. Um, and then the other question, which is sort of related, which is how quickly do they need to use the skill? Do you need kind of instantaneous reactions from your learners? Um, because you're gonna play, uh, you know, you to play, so, um, uh, how immediate do people need to access information in order to do a particular task? So I don't know how you do it here. In the US, we have annual tax returns that we have to prepare on our personal taxes. I'm sorry, this is totally a, a US reference fail. But if, if somebody needs to prepare their taxes annually, usually they have to get it done by April and they get the information sometime in January. The truth is they've got plenty of time to look this stuff up. I don't need that person to carry this information around in their head. I'm just gonna, just gonna do that one. How about making coffee? Somebody's a barista downstairs at the Costa or something like that. How quickly should they be able to access that information? Pretty quickly, right? Because otherwise you wind up with a really long queue and very grippy customers. But if they need to reference something or they need to stop or they need access to advice, it's not the end of the world. How about um, CPR? Immediately, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, I think there's little cards that people can carry in their office, but you really do want them responding quickly, right? <laughs> Not slowly. Um, sanitary food handling if they're a food service worker. Pretty much immediately as well, yeah, probably. Identifying money laundering in a financial scenario. You probably need them to carry that around in their head too, because otherwise they're just gonna blow right past it, which is a slightly different problem, but, but very related. 
Um, so how quickly, what's, and then the other part of that is what's their ability to access supporting information, especially if it's an infrequently used skill. So the frequency of use of the skill is gonna govern some of the, how automatic that skill becomes for people. And if it's infrequently used, it's not likely to become automatic unless you overtrain it um, initially. So which one do you think requires faster response? While the store is being robbed after the robbery is done if you're dealing with a fast food clerk. Which one needs faster response while the store is being robbed? Yeah, probably, right? Um, anybody wanna vote for after? No, okay. Um, yeah, so while the store is being robbed, I need that reaction to be almost automatic. And so I probably will have to overlearn it either through you know, scenarios. Hopefully they never have to deal with it, but you can't predict it, unfortunately. Um, after the robbery is done, they can probably pull the checklist out of the drawer and just kind of go through, go through the criteria on it. So speed of access and ability to access support, especially when you're dealing with infrequently used skills, is going to be one of the variables that you want to consider here. Um, so, and that's either overlearning for immediacy of use or access to support materials. Um, a, a brief thing about structures of skills practice, and then I'm hoping we still have time to, to do a brief chat about this. Um, uh, Miriam will recognize this, but um, although this is an old edition, what are, what are we up to now on this one? Do you know? I, it, there's at least a third edition. Yeah. Um, uh, so, 10 steps for complex learning is a super deep dive into this topic, and if you wanna go much, much further, you can get that book. Um, but a couple of the things they'll mention as variables is uh, when you're doing that kind of, especially when you're doing that kind of overlearning, you might look at accuracy, you might look at speed, and you might look at integration, so integrating it into a real-world context. And so taking those three variables are things that you're gonna sort of think about when you're doing your practice. Do I want them to be able to do it with as much time as necessary until they're accurate? Then I might have them do it as speed until they get up to that level of accuracy again. Then I might have to integrate it into other things so that they can, you know, once we're outside of the, the initial learning environment, they can still kind of perform. So those are some different variables you would play with when you're designing um, practice structures. Um, a format that I sometimes use, especially again with e-learning kinds of things is, Starting with examples, not examples. Can you tell if this is a good example or a, or a bad example or an example or a non-example? Can you critique an example? Can you tell me what's good or bad about it? Can I understand what principles I'm using to make that judgment? Can I generate new examples? So, um, and I'm not saying this is the only way to do skill curves, I'm just saying this is a strategy that I've used a few times that, that seems to work well depending on what it is. Um, so, uh, Example, non-example might be just sorting, is this harassment, is this not harassment? So I just, and the thing about it is, I talked to you about how important seeing multiple case examples are. They don't have to be complicated all the time. It doesn't have to be a big involved case study. It might be sorting 20 examples right here. You did that at the beginning when you played skill, not a skill, right? We went through about, I don't know, I think it's about a dozen examples or something like that. Um, so, so sometimes your exposure to case examples doesn't even have to be very complicated. It can be done quite quickly. Then it might be critiquing an example. So if I look at this, what do I think is good or bad about this? Um, it's a statement from a resume, for example. What's good or bad about it? Can I critique it? Can I say what's good or bad? And you can do it in a live scenario where people are just talking about it or you can give people checklists to do evaluation. There's different strategies for that. Then it might be, um, you know, generate, generalize out what kinds of principles might we see that would make this better so that I can start to kind of also think about it in an abstract way. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry, I'm missing a slide. I apologize. There should be one where you are actually writing your own example, but it, would, but it might be similar to the bullying example that we saw earlier. Um, so designing for skills. Um, so as people get good at things, especially when they get to that point of, of unconscious competence, there's a few different versions of this. I just happen to like this one. It's from Gloria Gary. Um, people get familiar with a task. People comprehend it. They get conscious effort, conscious action, proficiency, and then unconscious competence. So if you're learning to drive, familiarization is just learning like the things in the car. Comprehension is learning, a, understanding what I need to do to drive it. Conscious effort is about that point where like, you should be in a parking lot with nobody anywhere near you on like a Sunday afternoon, so it's empty because you're not very good at it yet, and it's still very, very effortful because you're still having to think about every single thing you do. Conscious action is about when you're starting to successfully execute. Proficiency is good enough to say pass the driver's test. 
not, still not a great driver, but you're pretty good. Um, unconscious competence, has anybody ever done that thing where you drive home from work or a familiar place and you pull into the driveway and you realize you totally don't remember the drive home at all? Yep. So that's what unconscious competence feels like. And this is my favorite example of it. This is a study of your brain on Tetris. I love this one. Um, it's a PET scan that shows glucose metabolic rate, which is a loose, I'm super oversimplifying, but a loose proxy for effort. So the brain on the left is somebody learning to play Tetris for the very first time where they're still not getting it and it's frustrating and the pieces keep coming and whatever. And then the brain scan on the left shows the amount of glucose being consumed when somebody has been playing Tetris, the same person has been playing Tetris for several weeks. Can't remember, maybe six weeks or something. They're obviously much better at Tetris, but the interesting thing is it's not that effort stays the same and proficiency goes up, it's that effort goes down as proficiency goes up. And it becomes automated, so you're doing it automatically, which means it can exist without a lot of conscious control. And the issue with that is when you change things and somebody goes from that back over to here, how do you think that feels? People love it, right? They're super delighted to have their uh, expertise and mastery interrupted with your new idea about what they should do. Uh, yeah, people get really grumpy about it. And it messes with some deep things. It's part of their sense of expertise and their proficiency of their jobs, and you're interrupting that and making them feel like, and you know, feel back like this again. And people have a lot of resistance to it. So one of the other elements of practice, and I will wrap this up soon, I promise. One of the other elements of practice is that um, if people practice enough that they can at least start to see it getting easier, they're gonna have a lot less resistance. They don't have to get all the way back to their level of proficiency, but if they get enough practice that they're like, oh, okay, it's getting easier, then they're leaving your learning situation with a lot less resistance than if you leave them you know, completely here. You practiced it once, sending you back out into the world. The conviction is this was the stupidest idea that management ever had, and I can't believe they're making us do this, right? As opposed to, okay, fine. You know, and I'm, okay, fine's not great, but it's still better than I am gonna circumvent this change with every fiber of my being. So, um, so we wanna think about practice intervals. I've just got a couple other points. A lot of times, cognitively effortful things are like biking uphill, and a lot of times our learning experiences are kind of all biking uphill. But if you look at how a video game is structured, They'll start with something hard, but they give you a chance to practice it. Then they ramp up. Then you get comfortable with it. Then they add a new monster. Then you get comfortable with it. Then they have the boss fight where you have to use everything you've learned to beat the boss. And people don't necessarily mind cycling through a couple of times until they get that proficiency and speed. So this is also part of your practice, your practice structure. Um, and then, so it might be enough initial exposure to execute enough initial practice on a simple problem in a safe way, safe practice on a harder problem, applying to a heavily coached real example, um, real world mentoring, that might be the progression that you're looking at, but you're trying to figure out how do I give people some comfort in getting used to it before I ramp up again, and things like that. It's a lot like Chick sent me high's flow, where it's a balance between how hard something is and how their ability is, you wanna kinda of keep them in between those two things. And I promised I would leave enough time for questions, so I'm just gonna wrap up real quick. One last point is, um, if somebody was learning to play basketball or football or whatever sport you want, would you ever structure a camp this way if you were teaching kids how to play? Day one, dribbling only. Day two, passing. Day three, just free throws. Day four, guarding. Day five, jumping all day long. Right, you'd never structure a sports camp that way. Where you're, but we do this all the time with our topic curriculum. So if I'm training new restaurant managers, I might have a day on food safety and a day on customer service and a day on managing and a day on ordering and a day on accounting, right? What happens to that knowledge about food safety from Monday by the time you get to Friday? Yeah, it's whoosh, right? Um, so if we do something where we're cycling through some of these subject areas, that's probably a more effective way to think about skills development. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but just hypothetically, you might do everything you need to about those areas to manage a shift. Then everything you need to do, know about those areas to manage a week. 
than everything you need to do about those areas to manage a quarter. And I, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could slice it, but the idea is food safety keeps coming back around and managing employees keeps coming back around and customer satisfaction keeps coming back around, which is much more sort of natural to the way that we typically do skills acquisition. So we're looking at ways to kind of cycle through things and gradually increase the difficulty and challenge associated with it. And I will just talk about a project management example we started with the procedural stuff, we did case studies, we did coaching, but then they did a monthly webinar to just share budgets that had gone wrong. And the idea was this is a way to increase the exposure to case examples without having to have the personal horrible experience yourself. You could benefit from other people's personal horrible experiences, which is hopefully more efficient. So um, that's it, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, I do have contact information here. Happy to answer questions. There's some resources there. I know it says Dev Learn and Not Learning Technologies because I didn't have time to change the URL. Um, and also, I, if you have other questions, I do have a Facebook group, um, in which you are all welcome to say you're from Learning Technologies. We'll add you in. Um, I'm also ha always happy to answer questions there as well. So thank you. have five minutes because uh, Julie has to dash off and get a plane um, so we've got her contact details there so can I just ask when you're asking your questions if you can make them nice and compact so we can get around the room because I'm pretty sure there'll be quite a lot of questions may not be <laughs> Um, yeah there is I think the link is at the dev learn link but there's a copy of this deck on SlideShare already so um, if you go there, I think the username that on my SlideShare account is the usable learning one, which is also my Twitter handle. So I'm pretty sure I'm right about them being at the, at the link, but if they're not, you can also just go straight to SlideShare and find them. You, have, uh, you talked about sound and, uh, well no, you talked about triggering memories. Yeah. And my brain sort of gets into using sound to, or, um, trigger memories in that, um, that you can, let's say I hear a song mm -hmm. um, and I go, that takes me back to when I did that. So do you think that it would work in a, a learning environment that's structured and Yeah, absolutely. All, all sorts of senses that are going to be in the environment where you're using the skill, if they're in the environment where you're learning the skill, it increases retention. Also, part of, um, especially things for chaotic where you're dealing with you know, disaster response or something, getting used to the sounds that you're gonna be hearing might be a big part of that kind of emotional self-regulation piece. So being able to kind of still function in, in a noisy or difficult environments, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I work with language learning. Any yeah. advice of how you would apply this to language learning? Oh, uh, a big question, I know. Yeah, no, that's sorry. Um, uh, I know enough about language learning to know that I don't know all that much about language learning and it's got its own kind of whole sort of school of thought. But I do think, um, I do think the exposure to case examples is always gonna be relevant in those environments. Um, and yeah, the practice piece, um, you know, obviously I know that within language learning there's some disconnect between the people who still wanna drill like vocabulary versus the people who wanna do much more of that immersive language learning environment. Um, I'm leaning personally towards that kind of mix of those kinds of things, so like overlearning a particular skill, but combined in with um, you know some more naturalistic practice. So I'm not 100% like we have to make everything naturalistic. You can still do drilling or some things like that for, especially for overlearning particular skills and things like that. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, well thank you so much. Thank you for your